All right, for those of you who just joined and you're wondering why it's so quiet, uh, good morning. Um, so what we're doing right now is uh, a brief warm up. So um, for the next four minutes, we're gonna check in again at 9.12. Um, I want you to uh, reflect on this picture that you see here, the statue honoring Teddy Roosevelt. And I want you to answer these three questions. Um, we're gonna revisit this later in uh, this morning's talk. Um, so this is some time to get your brain started up. All right, 9.12, time to move on. So we'll come and revisit these questions uh, later in today's talk. All right, so we're gonna use this uh, little thing called Slido. I don't know if uh, you've been using it all in Asia's class so far, um, but so you can either go to slido.com and enter in this number 6083, or you can uh, take a picture with your smartphone of the QR code and follow there. Um, but I just have a couple questions here just to sort of like see where we're all at. Um, you know, what is our understanding when we think about race uh, and biology? Um, so we're gonna, you know, hopefully we can get all 16 of you to answer. Um, right, I think. I think that is everyone student wise. Um, yeah, well, this is a, a nice split. Oops, didn't mean to go back so soon. Yeah, so uh, let's see, most of you disagree. Uh, many of you are unsure. And many of you also uh, agree with the statement. Great. So we're gonna we're gonna take a different stab at the same sort of question. You know, is there a scientific consensus that human racial categories are biologically sound? So the first one was, you know, trying to get a sense of whether or not uh, you viewed um, biology informing those definitions. But you know, as in all science, it's consensus based. So is there a consensus that how we define racial categories is scientifically sound? All right, interesting. Yeah. So. Uh, much more one-sided this in the second question. So maybe we don't actually know if the categories we came up with are useful or worthwhile. Um, yeah, well, this is great. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm using this because I'm trying to understand, you know, what points of my talk today to emphasize for you all and to gauge sort of your own understanding. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you participating in this and, um, We'll see, uh, you know, if many of your ideas change by the end of class. So as we get going uh, here today, um, you know, like, why am I here? What are we doing? Um, so I've got some learning objectives for you all. So by the end of today's class, uh, I hope you'll be able to explain how races were determined by early and modern scientists. I hope you'll feel confident uh, in critiquing biological definitions of race. And I hope that we'll get sort of a little, a little taste of how biological race influenced the field of conservation. Um, and so that's, that's what we're gonna be focusing on. So, um, I'll be keeping an eye out if there's any questions or things like that. But so this first little bit is, um, you know, the invention of race. How we defined race didn't always exist. How it is defined is always changing. And it started with natural historian and it moved into genetics. And so we're gonna be diving into the quote, scientific basis for how race is defined. And in some ways today's class is sort of a history lesson. Um, how did the past lead us here? And we're, we've got a lot to cover. So we're gonna start in sort of the enlightenment era. So right, you know, the era in which uh, our constitution was written but also the founding philosophy of science that we still are trained in today. And then we're gonna move through some of the 18th century naturalists, the 19th century naturalists into the progressive era in which conservation started and into modern science. And while we're gonna cover a lot, what I want us to think about is how we can follow the thread. What are the themes from these different areas and how do they inform where uh, we are today uh, and how we think about race in the sciences? 
So just delving right in with the philosophy of science, um, you know, from the Middle Ages, when we get to the Enlightenment era, we're inheriting a really hierarchical view of how the world works. So I know this is hard to read, but in this little medieval uh, diagram here, we've got uh, sort of the hierarchy of knowledge and the hierarchy um, of how of life going from stones to flame to plants and beasts to man, the heavens, angels, and God. And so having this real hierarchical view makes sense when we get into the Enlightenment era because science is trying to understand how does our understanding of the world change or fit into this hierarchy. And so by the age of the Enlightenment, um, instead of thinking about things so much from a religious standpoint, uh, Age of Alignment focused a lot on experience and rationality. Can we logically uh, think through things? Um, and whether you're Ben Franklin or Thomas Jefferson or Voltaire uh, or Goethe, you're trying to think of, you know, how can we progress humanity through this experience and rationality? But also answer this question, you know, how is man different from beast or how is it elevated from the rest of nature? And that's something that uh, plays out in a very subtle way throughout the history of science is how is man separated from nature? And so this is sort of uh, the underpinnings of um, the science that we practice today. And so to start with some scientific, scientific thinkers, we're gonna start with Francis Bacon. And no, even though it's breakfast time, not that type of bacon, but the bacon who developed uh, the scientific method. So Francis Bacon, in his view of the scientific method, you know, right, experimentation, um, you know, science is the only valid method for discovering truth and uncovering uh, knowledge. He also tried to argue that, you know, science and the way we do it can be universally good and that science is best when it serves all of mankind. But Bacon, like most scientific thinkers, was an aristocrat. And so really when he says when it serves all of mankind, he's really thinking how can science best serve the elite of society? Um, and specifically uh, in his definition, the gentlemanly class. And so Nandy in this piece, Science, Hegemony and Violence, has this quote explaining Francis Bacon's actual approach, which is that knowledge ought to be organized under the tutelage of temporal authority for the exclusive purpose of gaining power without regard to the questions of good and evil. And so right, if you make this assumption that science is universally good, you're not actually having to think about the ethical consequences of the work you do. So this is pretty different than how we think about science today for the most part, right? We still think of it as like science benefits everyone, but we don't think necessarily how it's playing into the political world around us. So David Hume, an also an enlightenment thinker who helped formulate uh, a lot of the scientific world that we play in today. Uh, he was influential in empiricism, right? And by empiricism, we mean that we can only generate knowledge from experience and observation. But he also argued that fact cannot be separated from value. But for some reason, despite this fact that you cannot separate fact from value, thought it was factual that all non-white peoples were inferior. And if he had listened to his own advice, he might question those assumptions he was making with this quote here, that when men are most sure and arrogant, they are commonly mistaken, given views to passion without that proper deliberation from which alone can secure them from the grossest absurdities. And so I, I play this here because what we're gonna see is that throughout the timeline of science, folks are gonna make some pretty radical arguments about race, but often they do not stand up to the own scientific arguments in which they address everything else. And so there's this underlying hypocrisy for how we apply science um, and how we think science both can answer questions about everything, but somehow is also separate from politics, economics, culture, et cetera. So what's the thread from this Enlightenment era of founding philosophy? Science is progress. It's the only valid form of knowledge. And that 
thinking of Hume, um, his views about why other groups were inferior mostly came from a political and a historical perspective. Science isn't inherently built into how we define and rank uh, human beings. And I have this little bit of point, bullet point here is like what we from get from this founding philosophy is that science is not separated from values and is inherently political, which is definitely not how we think about science today. So moving into the 18th century naturalists, we, it's important to talk about Carl Linnaeus or when he renamed himself Carlius Linnaeus, so that way it sounded better. Right, the founder of modern taxonomy. In 1758, he uh, created System Naturae, which described not only classifications of all living beings, but also described humans um, and different classifications of humans uh, with medical and biological traits. And so rather unoriginally, he, uh, in the same way that you might describe plants or animals based off of how they look or the geographic location from which they come from, Carl Linnaeus also defined human beings uh, sort of where they came from, but had this weird medical twist to it where you were either yellow, red, white, or black. And coming from one of those four groups, you had a whole bunch of traits that were just more or less opinions about the state of your disposition. And so because uh, Linnaeus classified everything um, as genus, species, subspecies, even though he deemed human varieties, it essentially became his argument as humans as different classes of subspecies. And it's really here that we see the start of biological races. And so even though today, while we may ignore the traits that he assigned human races, we still kind of use Linnaeus' system for classification. Comparing that to Comte de Buffon though, who is active at the same time, uh, he's described as sort of the father of evolutionary thinking, but in his Of the Varieties of the Human Species, um, instead of having four distinct groups like Linnaeus did, Comte de Buffon thought that humanity was all one species but that Europeans were the closest relatives to Adam and Eve and that all other peoples degenerated from Europeans. So Europeans were the purest. And we see that here in this quote on the right, that Europeans must dominate and subdue nature since the weak invidiated savage peoples of these different regions have neither the power to improve themselves nor because of their degenerate. And what he here means is distance from Adam and Eve can they bring about the necessary technological domination of nature? And so already we have different uh, definitions of race and different classifications of people. Here, Comte de Buffon is highly Eurocentric versus uh, Linnaeus's, which was maybe a little bit more geographically and what he thought medically defined. But at this point of time, there are tons of different thinkers who are coming up with different ways to classify race. And none of them have really a way to validate their classifications. So when we think about 18th century naturalists, what we build upon here from the Enlightenment area is, you know, how do we classify different species and the relationships? And the answer was like, well, just like other species, we can classify humans biologically, either with the external traits. So whether that's skin color or whatnot, we can classify them by what we see and where they occur. But just like uh, Comte de Buffon's quote, we also see now that biological definitions can justify policies and actions because other peoples, in, according to Comte de Buffon, were degenerates of Europeans. That means that they now have the excuse to go in and essentially do whatever they want in those lands and to those peoples. And we're going to see how that continues to build in the 19th century, right? And when we think about the 19th century, we can't talk about uh, people like Charles Darwin, um, you know, natural selection. Also, I'm going to start using some quotations to make some connections across these different eras. So Charles Darwin was a huge fanboy of Hume. I was highly influenced by his thinking that of, you know, how we uh, value observation but also in how we think about uh, values and how they play into science. In some of these ways, uh, by being a fan of Hume, it's what made Charles Darwin so reticent to publish 
uh, some of his thinking about natural selection, specifically because it would challenge sort of uh, the Christian creation story and he knew that it would be controversial. But despite Charles Darwin thinking that we all come from the same tree of life, that the similarities among humans and even among species is too great to come from different sources. And here what he's saying is it's too great for us to have evolved independently or to be different species, which was a common argument at this time, that you know, he provided the greatest possible scientific reason for why race or um, the biological definition of races shouldn't exist. And even when we think of how he defines species, he's saying that it's one that's arbitrary and it's for the sake of convenience, not because it's valid um, or has any more meaning other than that. So, right, radical thinker, revolutionary thinker, and despite having abolitionists in his family, so people arguing for the ending of slavery, but despite having the courage to directly challenge the Christian creation story, Charles Darwin still believed that it was, yeah, natural to think that men were superior to women and whites were superior to non-whites, even though he has no reason from his actual scientific thinking to think that. So he's being informed by the culture, not necessarily by his science. And this is important because that means the door is open to applied natural selection in cultural and social ways. So Ernst Haeckel here, a Darwin fanboy, he coined the term ecology. And right, we have this great inspirational quote, like, yeah, this is like how I like to think about ecology. By ecology, we understand the total science of connections of the organism to the surrounding external world. Like, yeah, I can get behind this guy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Haeckel was very much interested in applying evolutionary thinking to people around the globe and people even within Germany. Um, and I guess I just wanna take a brief pause here um, and give a content warning. So as we move through this, uh, we're gonna begin to see some more violent perspectives uh, towards people of different races and how that plays out uh, into things like genocide um, and the Holocaust. So I just wanna give that content warning um, and feel free to disengage um, if you need to. But uh, it is valuable to think about how this shaped our field. So Ernst Haeckel, while talking about ecology is also saying that the Caucasian species alone has had an actual history. It alone has attained the degree of civilization which raises men above the rest of nature. And so now we're seeing that evolutionary thinking is who is above nature and which peoples are still a part of nature. And because of that opens the door for eugenics and things along that line. And so his ecological thinking is directly informed and influences how he applies biology to the rest of the world. And we're gonna see that time and time again, which scientists, because they think science is the only valid form of knowledge, ignore politics, ignore history, ignore economics, apply this biological lens to justify the views of everyone else across the globe. So Ronald Fisher and Carl Pilgerson building off of Haeckel, um, right? These are the founder of modern day statistics and genetics. We've got this great quote from them, you know, experimental observations are only experience, right? That's the enlightenment era thinking, it's only experience carefully planned and advanced and designed to form a secure basis of new knowledge, right? This is exactly how we think about the studies we do today, by carefully planning in advance, that's where we get, you know, our objectivity. But at the same time, we have them saying, it is a weak humanitarianism, not a true humanism, which regrets that a capable and stalwart race of white men should replace a dark-skinned tribe which can neither utilize its land for the full benefit of mankind, nor contribute its quota to the common stock of human knowledge. So essentially he's saying, if you're a true humanist, from what we know from science, we can eliminate other peoples because they don't have what it takes or we cannot value them for the contributions they make. So very Eurocentric white supremacist view, but 
when we think about statistics and genetics, is that both Fisher and Pearson, the motivation for many of the statistical methods like ANOVA um, or discrimination analysis was specifically so they could find the evidence they needed to prove that other peoples were inferior. Um, and so it's a two-way street. It wasn't like they were acclaimed scientists and oh, they just happened to do it um, in the political realm as well. It's no, their political values directly influenced the work they did. Um, and if you go back and look at some of these publications, you're like, wait, they're not even following their own rules for analysis when they're trying to come up with the scientific evidence for the inferiority of other peoples. And to round out this era, so Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, and uh, someone who's a Pearson fanboy. Uh, hey, yes. Sorry to interrupt, we have a question. Oh, sure. thank you, yeah. Uh, was Fisher and Carl's work the basis for the later eugenics movement? Yes, and we are, uh, you know, sneak preview, eugenics. Um, but yeah, so um, Fisher eventually was the first department head of eugenics at the University of London. Um, their work, right, Fisher in his office had a whole, is like a weird, like imagine taking down a jewelry box and opening it up and instead of it being jewelry, it's different color eyeballs. And based off of those eyeballs, he would like hold it up to someone and be like, nope, you're not white, um, which is like as far from science as possible. But, you know, right, because he was like this big person and Pearson was this big person in the field, other folks would be like, you know, Germany essentially did the same thing, but with different colors of hair. And in Namibia at that time, which was one of their colonies, would, you know, hold up someone's hair to this all these different hair colors and textures and be like, oh, you're white enough, we won't kill you. Um, so Faith, uh, a lot of the quotes such are using dark skinned and other references to black people. Was there also much application to the people of Asian, Latin American, indigenous? Uh, yes. So, um, right, Linnaeus, even in his classifications was saying that, um, you know, the Americas, you know, red was their color. And if you're red, you have all these other traits that go with you. Um, and while we're talking about a lot of European thinkers, um, we're gonna transition um, in this next little bit to uh, American thinkers, but right, all of the Europeans at this point were imperialistic powers. So across Latin America, um, across Africa, across Asia, they are applying this and using it to justify their ability to colonize, right? Even if we think just about this as an English and British individuals, right? There's colonies in Asia, there's colonies in Africa, there's colonies in the Middle East, um, there's colonies everywhere. And so at this time, they're going out measuring human skulls, measuring eye color, measuring hair color and texture. And, you know, only, you know, not all of these scientists actually traveled to all these different places. All they're getting is the reports from, you know, like military personnel or political personnel of like, oh yeah, these people must be inferior. So let me find the scientific justification for it. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question, but yeah, thank you for, thank you for interrupting me, Asia. And thank you all for bringing the questions up. All right, so uh, culminating in this 19th century period of naturalists is Francis Galton, who Darwin's cousin is like, yeah, I find that talent is by inheritance to a remarkable degree. Like, right, <laughs> my, my cousin is Charles Darwin. I grew up rich and with access to whatever I wanted. So clearly talent is heritable. And it is uh, Darwin's cousin who in 1883 coined the term eugenics, um, which here we've got this, you know, all these different influences as the root, but the self-direction of human evolution. And eugenics is being built upon this idea that biological determinism, that all aspects of a person can be determined from biology. 
And that with these new insights to natural selection and applying natural selection to all these other peoples, like, oh, if we think Europeans are the fittest, then we can then go do whatever we want. But so how can um, eugenicists advance evolution by, you know, protecting the supreme bloodline from other uh, breeds? So we'll see. And so we're going to see how this plays a uh, part, especially in the Americas. But um, following this thread, so right, we see even in this 19th century naturalist movement, right, we're bringing the values of the enlightenment that we hold the keys to knowledge and that uh, this is a valid form of progress. Through the 18th century, we're beginning to classify peoples using this valid lens and the only lens of progress. In 19th century, now that we have um, this evolutionary thinking, we're thinking about how evolution explains human races. Um, and thinking about Haeckel specifically, right? How, who is raised above nature now means that we can use evolution to say, well, who isn't and who's still an animal to be dominated. Um, and the new focus on European supremacy. All right, which this gets us into the progressive era, right? The late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, and this is where our field particularly had, drew much of its inspiration, uh, even though throughout the globe, there's tons of different peoples who are already practicing what we might consider ecological stewardship. Um, so eugenics at this point is now like a progressive cause in the same way that conservation is progressive. It's like time to do reforms, time to apply our new understanding of the world to make the world a better place. So Rockefeller, Carnegie, Alexander Graham Bell, all these people we think of as super rich during the time of the progressive era. Like Rockefeller himself was like, Poverty is hereditary, so how can we like eliminate the people who pass down poverty in their bloodline? So all of them put together money to start the eugenics record office in New York, in the US, and all of them were, you know, influencing scientists and other policymakers at this time. It's important to also note that at this point, eugenics is widespread. Pretty much all of the world powers have eugenics programs, whether you're China, Japan, Australia, Britain, European powers, United States. Um, in Indiana, the first eugenics laws passed in 1907 in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, it's actually interesting. So Pennsylvania tried to pass eugenics law pretty much every two years from 1905 to 1921. Every year it passed the House and Senate in Pennsylvania, but it was only by the luck of the two governors, Penny Pack and Spruill, that they were repeatedly vetoed. And so in Pennsylvania, we were fortunate to not have widespread eugenics programming, but it doesn't mean that there weren't the people there who wanted to do it. And so by, you know, during this time, about two thirds of the states have eugenics laws. And so this brings us to the nascent beginning of what we consider the conservation movement. Um, so uh, let's see, we've got 40 minutes left. I'm just trying to think about time. Um, all right, so Teddy Roosevelt says next a little bit, we're gonna specifically focus on conservation folks, uh, see how they play into this progressive era and talk a tiny bit about, you know, um, you're gonna talk about this more, I think, um, throughout this course. Uh, so this is just gonna be a little, a little smattering, but right, We've got this quote that we would definitely associate with Teddy Roosevelt here. You know, the chase is the, the best of all national pastimes. So the chase being hunting. It cultivates that vigorous manliness for the lack of which in a nation or an individual, the possession of no other qualities can possibly atone, right? So yeah, makes sense that he's got this macho statue because according to him, like manliness is the single most important value a nation could possibly have. But at the same time, I might be like, yeah, cool, let's go hunting. In 1905, Teddy Roosevelt is also saying, 
the backward race be trained so that it may enter into the possession of true freedom, while the forward race is enabled to preserve unharmed the high civilization wrought out by its forefathers. So this is very much tying into that white saviorism, that paternalism, that in his mind, the backward race being pretty much anyone who's not white, Blacks, uh, Native Americans, the key goal of the progressive era is how can we eliminate their culture and try and assimilate them so that uh, you know they can possess true freedom because they don't they're not seen as having freedom or a valid form of civilization right now. While the forward race here being whites here being Teddy Roosevelt is able to preserve the highest civilization of which Teddy Roosevelt thinks the hunt and conservation is part of. So in his mind, uh, you know, assimilating and eliminating these other cultures is key. So that way the hallmarks of civilization can be preserved, such as what we view as nature or wilderness or the hunt. And so uh, I've got five other individuals I wanna talk about. Um, but, uh, you know, let's, let's let you decide. So we got fisheries, zoos, forestry, wildlife, national parks. Uh, what do y'all want to see first? Okay. Let's do wildlife. So nothing broke my heart more than learning Aldo Leopold also had problematic views, right? We, we know him as the, the father of wildlife management. Um, we read his Santa Economy Almanac. His land ethic is totally awesome. And we have this quote here, right? That there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot, which can see pretty innocuous. And like, yeah, like from a value standpoint, there are some people who value wild spaces and some who don't. But we also have to think about, you know, how else could this be interpreted? And, you know, Alda Leopold did not have his was like not like everyone uniformly loved him during his time. So Michael Flint, another fellow forester in 1926, perhaps Leopold wants the wilderness to himself and the elect few. And right, wilderness, or Leopold's philosophy is entirely based on excluding people from wild spaces. His view was that the people who are entitled to wild spaces and the example he uses are the folks who can go take a two week trip by foot into these vast expanses. And the worst possible thing would be to make them accessible by cars. And we could talk about that more, but I think it's important to also know that at the same time, Leopold is talking with people and being convinced that we should pass immigration laws that specifically keep out people who they viewed, so Eastern Europeans, um, uh, we'll talk about this immigration law in a little bit, but Leopold was also at this point being influenced saying like, yeah, maybe there are people we should keep out of the country because their presence alone might damage uh, the wilderness that we hold in high esteem. All right, what next? Zoos, all right. So Madison Grant. So he, uh, in addition to being influential in the national park system, was the co-founder of the Bronx Zoo, which is now also the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, and so while he has great achievements, at the same time when conservation is nascent and being born, um, he is specifically directing conservation uh, in a eugenics framework. So I'm not gonna include any quotes from him because he's kind of a reviling dude, but uh, his book that he authored is what Adolf Hitler referred to as my Bible. And one of uh, Madison Grant's uh, big legislation victories is the 1924 Immigration Act, which was specifically to preserve the ideal of US homogeneity, specifically for what Madison Grant called the Nordic race. Um, which is kind of hilarious because when, if you hear about his book, his argument was that like really important people like Leonardo da Vinci were actually Nordic and came from uh, Scandinavia because in his view, uh, 
Italians, Greeks, Mediterranean people were also not white and were inferior. Um, Jesus was also Nordic somehow. Um, I'm not sure how that works, but right, like it doesn't matter if it's consistent or not. He was influential in, but was pushing through zoos. So um, Isha, I don't know if you talked about Otabenga yet um, or will, but uh, Mass and Grant was all about like, how can we put human beings in zoos to show like how someone from Africa could be the missing link in evolution? Or how can we make national parks really hard to get to so that way lower caste folks can't have access to them? Or in this uh, kind of the anti-immigration uh, bit of how can we keep out certain people from ruining the, uh, the race of America? All right, one more. So Gifford Pinchot, the purpose of conservation, the greatest good to the greatest number of people for the longest time. Which once again, it's like super inspiring. Like, yes, we should be managing our resources so that way everyone can benefit. But right at this point, like, hey, 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 we have to start thinking about who does Gifford Pinchot define as people? Because right, we've got this long history in science of saying, well, if someone's not a person, then we no longer have to care about them. And this is true um, in how they viewed conservation. So in this commission chaired by Pinchot and endorsed by Teddy Roosevelt, we have this quote, if our nation cares to make any provision for its grandchildren and its grandchildren's grandchildren, this provision must include conservation in all, in all of its branches, but above all, the conservation of the racial stock itself. And so all of these folks, like, here, like I think, it can't be understated what this quote is saying, that it doesn't matter how we control our natural resources. It doesn't matter how we use them. Literally the most important thing for preserving the resources that we care about is preserving the type of people we allowed to reproduce or immigrate or come to the country. Like that's a pretty profound and strong statement to make, especially when we think in our own scientific training, it's like, no, who cares about the people? It's about how we use the resources. It's almost like we've taken this top quote um, and forgotten um, this bottom quote. Okay, so we've seen how it plays out in forestry. We've seen how it plays out in zoos. Um, we'll see how it plays out in wildlife management. And what can we take away from that? It's that it's morally imperative to reduce or eliminate groups considered biologically inferior, and that that is like a progressive good thing to do, and that the control of natural resources is built off eugenics assumptions. And I think, you know, in Asia's class, you're going to see at the international scale how that attitude manifests of who has a right to the resources and who's coming in with the mentality of like, no, we know what's best, you don't. All right, so we got 20 minutes left. We're gonna sail through the modern period and how that plays out. So modern science, um, and this is how, what I call, you know, how an insidious idea or how the idea of biological races never really went away and why it's actually not biologically valid. So one thing I just want to hint is that, you know, when we go through a historical lesson like this, we often say, oh, well, they're just products of their time. Like, while we may not be surprised they had these views, I think it's also important to remember that at any given time point we've talked about so far, there are people who are actively arguing against these concepts of race or these concepts of dominance. And all of these people are wealthy and in the know. So it's not that like, oh, they just didn't know that there was an alternative viewpoint. It's like, no, this was their value system that they chose and chose not to challenge, right? So this quote by Alfred Russell, Wa <laughs> Alfred Russell Wallace, you know, the co-founder or the co-discoverer of natural selection, right, is give the people good conditions, improve their environment, and all will tend towards the highest type. 
Eugenics is simply the meddlesome interference of an arrogant scientific pre priestcraft. It is a mere excuse for medical tyranny. So, you know, at this time also like Alexander von Humboldt, uh, you know, Humboldt University discovered a lot of scientific things. Also was like, no, there is no biological reason for us to view some uh, races as better or more advanced than others. That's not how biology works. And so thinking about this modern science period, the natural culmination of when you view certain people as, as inferior, when you view them not even as people, when you take eugenics to its extreme, which is how can we prevent people from polluting the gene pool, um, right? What we all think, or what most of us, the conclusion that comes to, right, is the Holocaust and Nazism and uh, how if we take this idea of biological race to the extreme that you know a conclusion is to eliminate those peoples um, and i think what we see in the history of how we define biological race is that at the end of the holocaust at the end of world war ii all of a sudden everyone realizes how terrible eugenics is how errant uh, biological race is, and it just suddenly disappears, and we we forgot about it. Um, but that's simply not the case. So I'm going to skip this. Um, but when we think about science, even today, we think about it being objective. We think about it being for the benefit of all mankind. We don't necessarily think of it as like in the mucky dirt of problematic political decisions. Like, right, when we think about Nazism in particular, we think of like, that was like a weird off branch of some unusual fascists. And like science was not complicit. Um, but uh, we're gonna take a look at that real quickly and how having that view sort of blinds us to what can still be going on today. So right, the natural conclusion of scientific racism are these really violent acts like we see in the Holocaust. And uh, one interesting thing is the Max Planck Institute, which many of you probably have heard of. It's produced 18 Nobel Prize winners. It like, publishes a ton of papers across fields each year. Well, in the early 2000s, they were like, we're going to take the bold move and see how our institute was involved in uh, the Holocaust. Because at that time, it used to be the Kaiser Wilhelm Society. And what they dug up was like pretty horrifying, was that not only did, um, you know, this noble institute actively support Nazi agendas, but also like, it exterminated four of their own employees in concentration camps. And so if science can play an active and willing role in the Holocaust, how is it playing an active and willing role in problematic policies and practices today? And so did scientific racism really end with the Nazis? Um, so the Galton National Laboratory of Eugenics in London after the war becomes the Department of Genetics, Evolution and Environment. Von Verschauer, who is an Auschwitz scientist, you know, doesn't get charged with anything, becomes a professor of human genetics. And the 1989, uh, or in 1989, which is really late, you would think, the Eugenics Society becomes the Galton Institute, and to this day still offers the Artemis Award, which is for people trying to do fertility control in poor communities, which now, seeing the name Galton, we should know, like, okay, there's some eugenic stuff still going on here. Um, sterilization, um, forced sterilization policies that many of the conservation founders uh, supported, right? North Carolina didn't stop sterilizing people until 1974. California still sterilized inmates uh, in the early 2000s. Right, just last year, we see that you know ICE is accused of sterilizing detainees um, forcibly, uh, and so you know why 
why would places continue to do this, right? And it's because still in this mindset, eugenics is real. Um, and we're going to see how that plays out too in, in the scientific realm, right? So James Watson, who discovers, you know, along with uh, Rosalind Franklin and Francis Crick, the structure of DNA to this day, James Watson's still alive. He believes Brahmins from India and Jewish people are the world's smartest races, specifically because they must have been uh, genetically breeding themselves for thousands of years. Like, what? Um, what we see too is that now the field of genetics is kind of a smokescreen for eugenics. So Dobzhansky, who created the modern synthesis of genetics evolution in his 1968 book, is that eugenics has a sound core. Or Ernst Mayer, who this is, you know, a big fan of Comte de Buffon. He's the one who calls Comte de Buffon the father of evolution. But in his 1942 concept of the species, which is what we use all today, his is that a good species is a population whose gene pool is separate through reproductive isolation. And right, while we largely think about this geographically, um, you know, I think especially in graduate school or when you really delve into Ernst Mayer's definition of species, like it breaks down at a lot of different points. But what we can see here is that if you're a eugenics person, then to maintain a healthy population, you have to isolate reproduction. And it's kind of no surprise then that Ernst Mayer in his head, is that biological race is a valid idea. And he argued it until his death in 2005. But even then he can't, he's like, right, it's biologically valid, but in the same breath, he's also saying that geographic races may be entirely cultural and have no biological underpinnings. It's like, what? Like weird hypocrisy, can't even defend his own ideas validly with just science. And the reason why, you know, at this point we're beginning to see genetics as a smokescreen um, is that modern genetic discoveries are the forces that are showing how silly human race, or in this case, human race, is as a biological concept. So one core to the idea that people come from different biological races is that there must be some reproductive isolation geographically that's happened for a super long time. So that way races could evolve differently. And what we know now is that migration is more vast than ever thought before. Um, you know, people in the subcontinent of India are highly related to people in Europe because of the migration of the Yam Yamnaya people um, about 9,000 years ago. And I think one quick heuristic that really puts this into place is that if we go back 3,600 years, there is the common ancestor of everyone who's alive today. Right, so all of us in this classroom, we all have a common ancestor 3,600 years ago. Is 3,600 years enough time for races to evolve consistent traits that make them different? Not really. When we think about genetic variability and the genes that are prominent across the globe is that within a single population, which is a sort of lingo for race in modern genetic uh, literature, is that you know there's so much variation within a group that it makes it ridiculous to assume that there are any differences between groups. So like, right, there's more genetic variation in Africa than there is across the entire globe, or there's more genetic variation within you know, people in the Southwest United States than there is between people of the Southwest United States and East Asia. And lastly, that, you know, what sort of uh, killed eugenics, but also challenges our idea of race is that biological determinism is way too simplistic, right? Even think about Francis, or excuse me, Watson, who was like, oh yes, the Brahmins, and the Jewish people must be the smartest and it must be genetic inheritable. It's like, right, 
what we see is that IQ is largely explained by environmental conditions and that only 15% of what a person's IQ is can actually be explained by their parents' IQ. So like as science progresses, we're actively challenging our notions of like how genetics works and how it explains the traits across different biological groups. Skin tone is like, there's only a few pigmentation genes. There's no other genes aside from a few pigmentation genes that are found solely in one group of people. And we're also, what we're learning about skin tone, which is how most races are defined, is that it's an ancestral trait. Um, it's been there, uh, you know, once again, going to Africa, there's most of the skin tones of the human race found in Africa. They didn't necessarily evolve independently. Um, and this challenges the notion, right? If we think about white supremacy being separate from European supremacy, is that lighter skin did not actually evolve in Europe. And this is perhaps best explained in the discovery of Cheddar Man. Cheddar, uh, because it's found uh, in a specific region in Britain, but uh, Cheddar Man remains found in 2018 uh, from 9,100 years ago. When it was first discovered, everyone was super excited because like here was the first modern British person like, what did they look like? Who were they? And when it was reconstructed, there was like this huge national reckoning of, you know, Cheddar Man was, you know, here's this rendition of him, was by all conditions what we would describe as black or dark skinned. Um, you know, here we see dark skinned blue eyes. And right, so the people who created Stonehenge, the people that, you know, people imagined as the first Britons or the first British were actually not white. And this challenges our understanding or notions about what race is and what supremacy is. And the story of Cheddar Man itself sort of subverts this narrative that uh, has been told. And so following the thread, um, you know, we've had to go, we've gone through a lot of information today. Um, and I hope that what we can see is that there's this coherent connection of ideas, whether it's enlightenment to modern day science, that despite scientists not being able to satisfyingly explain race via biology or genetics or natural history, it's like a super enticing idea to believe, right? Even in the 60s, even now, there are scientists who want to find the genetic underpinnings of everything, who want to find the genetic explanations of why we see uh, different social phenomenon. So, right, like, why do poor and communities of color perform less on standardized tests? Well, right, there are people who still want to find the genetic reasoning, not quality of education not other social economic factors. And so what founded in the enlightenment era still manifests itself today. We're sort of seduced by this powerful idea. But, um, you know, at the beginning of the class, you know, many of you were unsure about how race is defined. And many of you uh, agree that race is defined from a biological standpoint. And what I'm hoping that you can leave uh, today's class with is that no, it's not actually biological. Even if today we look at genetics, which is you know right, the most powerful tool we might have for understanding ancestry, it's that uh, there's not a genetic story for different races for how we define them. Right, and you know, I didn't talk about today, but maybe you'll explore this throughout the rest of Asia's class. Is that right? There are so many definitions of race. Right, if we look at uh, Madison Grant, who influenced the formulation of what we consider the Aryan race or the Nordic race, like to him, Mediterranean Europeans, like the Spanish, uh, Italians, Greeks. And his idea, they are not white people. 
if you look at uh, Linnaeus, he defined different groups of race compared to other scientists at his time. And so race is constantly being changed. But what the reason that it's constantly being changed is that it's really a cultural definition. It is a political definition. So that way you can open up the doors to colonize, which is about controlling and extracting what you want. So we see even in things like the Holocaust, we see um, you know, in conservation itself, right? How do indigenous groups have rights to their own um, lands, to their own resources? Uh, we didn't talk about John Muir. We didn't go into depth, but right? Like conservation is built off of indigenous removal. So right, how can we use racism as a cultural tool to wage genocide, to enslave, like to generally violate human rights in order to control and extract what we want? And that specifically, scientists are especially prone to being complicit in this because we're sort of blinded by objectivity. We think that we are truly objective, whereas Hume, even in the Enlightenment era, was like, no, all facts cannot be separated from values. We bring this cultural context to everything we do, right? Scientists are especially prone and the fact that we could even believe science was not involved in the Holocaust, that science is somehow apolitical, above the dirt, and is universally good for humankind. And lastly, that, you know, because we think science is the only valid form of knowledge and progress, we can sort of ignore politics, we can ignore economics, we can ignore history, which may do a way better job in explaining things we see than genetics or things like that. So um, I hope that was cohesive. I hope that makes sense. I hope that you know it takes time for some of these connections to solidify. But major figures, um, but that like biological race is such an enticing idea that major figures, even through the 60s in the ecological field, even in the early 20th century in the conservation field, tried to implement it in ways that contradicted their own work. So in our own uh, applications today, we have to be super cognizant of what cultural assumptions are we bringing to the table when we're engaging with groups who we perceive as different from us? What history do we need to bring along? What historical understanding do we need to bring along to understand uh, different cultural groups' values, their experiences, their doubts, their assumptions, and what doubt assumptions are we making as well? And I just want to close on, um, right? Uh, even today, uh, genetic and biological race is like rampant, right? All of the modern genetics products led by, you know, National Geographic Society was the first one to come out with it. It's like, right, all of these want to tell you what percent race you are. All of these want to tell you, you know, what your heritage is. And the funny fact is that none of these actually tell you heritage. What they do is based off of people who have taken their test and where those people live, tells you how closely related you are to people in their current database. So like a common thing to do if you're in white supremacist circles is to just go take a ton of tests and wait to see based off the database of each company, which one tells you, you know, you're only Nordic or you're only Anglo-Saxon. But none of these actually have a good idea of like what was historical or what is heritage. And right, like, even though we know genetically, there's no such thing as, um, you know, black, there's no such thing as Hispanic, there's no such thing as white, there's no such thing um, genetically, it, it uses these social cultural applications in still a biological way. So I know I've taken up most of our time, but 
I want you to come now with a skepticism. I want you to come now with this knowledge of like, well, genetically, we don't know what's going like, there's no basis for the scientific argument of race. It's a cultural and political one that still has real uh, ramifications. So yeah, question time. I know we're like 